Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless you. We honor you. And we adore you. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you, O oh God in heaven, for blessing us with your word. Lord, even as we look into this law of liberty, may we be set free from ourselves. Amen. May we be set free from beliefs, from worldviews. May we be set free from anything that holds us back. Every entanglement, we break it in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we pray that you make our hearts like fertile grounds that the seed will be sown and the seed will grow and it will become fruitful in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our Lord and our God. Amen. 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 Well, I must confess that um, a little bit of our time is gone, but um, we will try within the time we still have left to um, have some more understanding of the topic that we started last week. Um, last week, a good number of you were here. Of course, there were many that are not, there are some that were not here. Um, last week we, and of course, not just last week, even in the previous um, weeks, there have been messages that the Lord brought to us on fruitfulness. Last week I said, these have been wonderful messages. And, um, and when I was asked to, to preach again, I said, eh? on this, this same subject matter, and the Lord corrected me. The Lord told me that that's wrong. Scripture is all about fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. So from Genesis, right from Genesis, a lot of fruitfulness, you know, comes to play. Right spreading across the scripture, right to re revelations. So I'd like us to quickly look at the passage we read, and then we will continue from where we stopped. What is the topic? The topic is Biblical Principles of Fruitfulness, Part 2. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. We will also read Psalm 1. Verses 1 to 3, and then look at this that we've been re rehearsing, you know, Genesis 9, 7. I mean, we've said it several times, so we will say it again this morning or this afternoon. Genesis 1, 26, 28, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, 
be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Psalm 1 and verses 1 to 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. I like us to well, um, please can we project Genesis 7, sorry, Ge Genesis 9 and verse 7. Can that be projected? I want the church to read that. I want all of us to read that together. Good. It's there for us. Can we go, you know, Genesis 9, 7. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth. Multiply in it. Praise the Lord. Now, this was God's command to um, Noah. So I like us, God is telling us just the same thing. So as pastor has, you know, taught us to say that as for me, so the you changes to me, I will be fruitful, I will multiply, and so on and so forth. So we, this is, uh, I want us to say that now. I will say it again so that it, it, I guide us. You will say, as for me. So maybe you just repeat after me. Okay? Say, as for me. As for me. I will be fruitful. I will be fruitful. Let's start that again. Say, as for me. Say it with some confidence. As, as for, for me. me. I will be fruitful. I will, be fruitful. I will multiply. I will multiply. To populate the earth. Abundantly. And to multiply in it. That is God speaking to us. And we are accepting that as for us, we will be fruitful. Praise the name of the Lord. So last week, very quickly, we looked at some principles of fruitfulness. Some principles of fruitfulness and there were a number of them we looked at and I just want to just pick them up, you know, quickly so that we can see what does the Lord have for us today. First, what we tried to do last week was to be a little more practical. We were graphic with our demonstration. We brought in some fruits and as if as if you are Sunday school children. But I felt it was very, very important that we don't have to just use dictionary definitions. We need to look at it. You know. We had two bowls here. One was full of fruits. The other was empty. The one that was full of fruit was said to be fruitful. The one that was empty was what? Fruitless. And we did say that God is happy with fruitfulness. God really wants us to be fruitful. 
That is, that is the reason why the first thing God told man after creating him, after blessing him, he said, be fruitful. It's just like maybe an artist creating something. Then he speaks to this thing. And the first thing that this thing heard is the concept of fruitfulness. You remember, Adam didn't know anything about fruitfulness. He didn't know. He didn't know what it was. He had seen animals. He had seen all the things that God created. But he didn't know anything about fruitfulness. But when God spoke the words, be fruitful, it's as if it animated Adam. Because it went right into his DNA. It went into the fabric of his very being, the idea of fruitfulness. And you know, God did not just say to um, Adam, be fruitful. He, he spoke life into all the things he created. Be fruitful, including trees, including you know, plants, including wildlife, everything. Be fruitful, be fruitful. And um, we ask the question, what is a farmer looking for when he cultivates his land, when he irrigates his land, when he puts seed on the ground? What is he looking for? And we answered, we said, it is fruit he's looking for. And then we ask again, what is God looking for from this man that he's created? He has made you in his own image. He has made you looking so fine, so handsome, so strong, what is God looking for? What does God ask of you? God is looking for fruit. Fruits from you. And we said that fruitfulness indeed is the like the main reason for your, your 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 being because god wants you to be fruitful he wants to populate the earth with people so of course with other other living things you want to populate the earth so we said that you were created for fruitfulness. That is the reason for your creation, for fruitfulness. We then said that there are various types of fruits, and we looked at them. You know, there are various types of fruits that God is demanding from us. We look at the types of fruits we started with spiritual fruits and we said spiritual fruits can be broken down into you know two main parts one is soul winning reaching out to others bringing them to Christ you remember the passage that we have read often here in Daniel that anyone who wins soul is wise Okay, so, and a lot of emphasis has been made by our Lord Jesus Christ also. In Mark 16, 15, the Bible says, you know, Jesus himself said, Go ye therefore, and, you know, go you into the world and preach the gospel, the gospel to every creature. Go ye. And the more popular one is in Matthew, Matthew 28, particularly verses 18 to 9, I mean to 21, Matthew. And Jesus came to them and spoke to them, I mean he came and spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go 
and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. God wants us to make fruits, to reach out to others. The B part of um, this fruitfulness we saw in Galatians. Galatians 5.22. I think we are really used to this now. Because I remember we once did a Bible study on this. The fruit of the Spirit. I'm sure if I ask some of our, our people, they will, just, they will sing it through. So the fruit of the Spirit. The Bible says... But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience or long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And, and the Bible ends that passage by saying, you know, there's no law against any of these. Now these are the fruits that God wants us to produce in our lives. So we, we, we then quickly looked at in what way does God want, want us actually to show our fruitfulness? Now, when we talk of fruitfulness, what easily comes to mind is making children. Yes, I want to make children. We are starting a family to make children. Rachel and her Husband, I guess that is that is number one on your list, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, it is good. It's it's absolutely good. I mean, as husband and wife, that is right. Okay. But we saw that apart from making children, that God wants us to be fruitful in the works of our hands. We gave some scriptural passages for that. God wants us to be fruitful in the works of our hands. Let me see what scripture we gave for that. Right. We Proverbs 31, 31. We saw, you know, um, the virtuous woman, you know, the Bible says you should give, you know, she should be given the fruit of her hands and let her own work praise her in the gates. So our hands should be fruitful. I also did mention two people in Exodus 31 verses 1 to 6, Bezalel and Oholiab. These are two young Jewish people, I mean Jewish men, you know, they were, God gifted them with skills in fine arts. Skills in fine arts. And God blessed them. And those are the guys that Moses used to build, you know, the Ark of the Covenant. Very beautiful. They were creative. Now what does that tell us? The fruit of our hands. Our young people, even the old, please check again. What can my hand do? What can it do more than what I'm using it for at the moment? There are some people that have beautiful hands. They just have beautiful hands. Do you know that? Whatever they touch, it works so well. Whatever they lay their hands upon to do, it works well. We have this lady, um, and I can see a, a similarity, really. You know, even in this church, permit me to mention names. Sister Jeanette is one person that knows how to use her hands to do some manipulative skills. <laughs> You know, that is the fruit of our hands. We have this lady, you know, back 
in, in Plato, you know, in the church I used to belong to, she was absolutely good in arranging flowers. So, you know, she was doing it for the church. And it got to a point that if there was a big wedding, they would say, oh, Mrs. I wouldn't want to mention names. Mrs. She can do it. And they will bring her. Once she lays her hands, she will beautify the place. Manipulative skills. Skills, that is the fruit of our hands. What are the fruit of our lips? The Bible talks about the fruit of our lips. In Romans 12 and verse 2, Sorry, um, that's the fruit of our minds. The fruit of our lips. Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips. Giving thanks to him. Giving thanks to God. The fruit of our lips. It's a sacrifice of praise. There are some of us here that are gifted with the fruit of the lips. They can sing songs. So please explore more. What, what more can I do to give glory to God, to give thanks to him, to worship him? The fruit of our minds was one of the things we talked about and how does that look? We said in Romans 12, 2, the Bible says, And do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, the renewing of our minds, what can we do with our minds? You know, there are people that in their minds they are so gifted, they can sit down and start writing a play, start producing a play. They will, they will think out all the scenes in their head, the fruit of the mind. And before long, that play that started from the mind, you see it being acted on, on big stages. That is the fruit of the mind. So what can you do? For others, God has given them that skill of writing. It started here in the mind, and before long, a big book has been written. Are you thinking of writing, bringing out the fruit of your mind, and putting it on paper, please don't hesitate. The Lord will help you. Amen. Because it's part of fruitfulness. Amen? Amen? And we did say that God hates fruitfulness. I, I wouldn't want to continue with that. I want us to actually really move forward. Okay? Um, God hates fruitful, fruitlessness. And there are scriptures that tell us that, you know, but I can't help telling you, I mean, remind you of this, that Jesus, when he was hungry, he went to that fig tree to pluck some fig to eat. But when he got to the, 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 the fig tree, what did he see? Leaves. Nothing but leaves. No fruit. It was fruitless like that empty bowl. It was fruitless. And Jesus did something. He cast the, the, you know, that tree, he cast it. May you never produce fruit again. May you never produce fruit again. So that tells me something. That if you are fruitless, God can cut you. In fact, in our main, one of our main passages in um, John 15, the Bible talks about cutting down any branch that 
does not produce. Do you want to be cut away? You want to be severed from, from the main stem? No. Nobody likes that. Nobody likes that. Therefore, we should obey the commandment of God to bear fruit so that nobody curses us, nobody cuts us off. Amen? Amen. I'd like us to just quickly consider um, a, a, you know, some keys to fruitfulness. Keys to fruitfulness. Now, the first key to fruitfulness is that for a tree or for, for any, anything, any crop at all, to actually produce fruit, it must be planted in the right soil. So, the right seed, good seed, onto good soil. Okay. Now, farmers know that very well, that for them to have a bumper harvest, for them to, to have a big harvest, they need to get good seed. They need to take that good seed and plant it on good soil. Because once you have the right seed and on the right soil, then that's a very good place to start. And of course, with the weather being in your favor, maybe the rains come. Before long, the whole field is covered. It's covered with, you know, crops. Now, that is physical. But in the spiritual realm, it's the same thing that for you to be able to bear fruit, you must be planted in the right soil. Now, what is the soil? The soil is Jesus Christ himself. You must be born again. You know, there was this man in scripture, in John chapter three, starting from verse one, this gentleman, you know his name? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Now Nicodemus had watched the lifestyle of Jesus. He noticed that Jesus' talk was very fruitful. He could see that you know each time Jesus went out, he was thronged. So many people will gather and he would teach them. Now Nicodemus was, was a lawyer. In fact, the Bible tells us that he was a teacher of the law. He, meaning he, a Pharisee, and Pharisees in those days, they were the high class, very high class. Now, he was a teacher of the law, but then he saw something different about Jesus. Yes, he had seen so many um, you know, teachers with, with maybe a few disciples. But for Jesus, he saw Jesus, he had 12 disciples, and he noticed that apart from the 12, there were so many other disciples. There were also so many people in the crowd. He remembered that the other day Jesus fed 500 people. I mean, 5,000 people? Yeah. Right. He remembered. He remembered that Jesus cleansed some lepers. He also remembered that blind Bartimaeus, you know, received his sight. And he looked at them as Pharisees. None of them could do anything that Jesus had done. So he chose to go to Jesus during the cover of the night. 
He didn't want people to point at him. Ah, what are you doing there? What are you? You, you, you are a teacher. You are a lawyer. What are you doing? But he chose to go in the night. And what was he trying to find out? How are you able to do these things? If I started by telling him, Rabbi, Rabbi is, 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 a, is a name to honor a teacher, a teacher like a teacher of teachers. He asked him, how are you able to do this? What can I do to be saved? What can I do? And Jesus told him something. Um, can, can, can you project um, John 3.3? 3? Jesus answered him and said, Truly, truly, I said to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You know, it's like Nicodemus was saying, how come you, you, you are, you are, your ministry is so fruitful? How did you do it? How are you able to do that? Jesus gave him a simple answer. You must be born again. For you to have this kind of fruitfulness, you must be born again. So I say the same thing to us this day. That for us to be fruitful, we must be born again. Jesus himself said in John chapter 12 and verse 24, he said something that is very profound and it has remained like a universal truth. He said, most assuredly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Just take maybe a seed of beans. You can go home and plant it. That seed, you know, get, get the humus, some nice place to put, put that seed. And that seed can never bear fruit unless it dies. Unless it goes to the ground. I'm not saying this, the life in the seed will die. But unless it, you, you can't eat that seed again. Because it has changed. You know, it's, it has changed. Because it has to die so that a new one will spring up. And that is the life of the Christian. Jesus was giving this um, John 12, 24. He was saying it about his own life. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. In fact, he was like making a prophecy about his own death. Jesus knew he had come to make fruit. But unless this one dies. He will just remain a single teacher. But when he, when he dies, he will bear more fruits. And that's why you and I are here to, today. Praise the name of the Lord. Because he died. And now, because of his death, he has, he has had fruits. Not just the twelve disciples, but Fruits all over the world. So, for us to be fruitful, we must sacrifice ourselves. We must die. Die to sin. I'm not asking anybody to go and kill himself. But we must die to sin. We must die to the works of the flesh. Galatians talk, talks about the works of the flesh, they are plain. They are all just, just plain. They are adultery, hatred, I mean, hatred, you know, doing all kinds of evil things. And Paul, Apostle Paul, in Galatians 
He said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the body, I live uh, by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. Now, some of us, we, said, we say we are Christians. We say we want to be fruitful. But we are still doing things that actually can destroy the fruit, that can destroy the plant. We cannot be fruitful when we are still involved in, when, when we are still alive to sin. Paul in Romans 12 said we should be dead to these things. We should be dead, but alive in Christ. Amen? Amen. So that is, for us to be fruitful, we must sow ourselves, we must start very well. We must turn in Christ. We must be born again. Born, being born again requires repentance. It requires turning away from your sins. It requires um, asking Jesus to come into your life. It requires taking him by faith. It is by faith you've been saved. You know, salvation is by faith. Romans 10 and verses 9 to 10. I keep saying whenever I have an opportunity to share that this is the passage that drew me to faith in Christ. This is the passage that I say, ah, so you mean it's so easy to just become a Christian? But this is the, the passage that drew me to faith. It says that if I confess Jesus with my mouth, I confess Jesus Christ, if I confess him with my mouth, and that I declare that he is Lord in my heart. If I do that, confession with the mouth, believing in my heart, and then accepting the work of God, the finished work of salvation in Jesus Christ. You will be saved. Very simple. So, if you want to be fruitful, you have to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. You have to believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. If you do all that, you will be saved. And when you are saved, you know, something, what happens when you, when you do that, God writes your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Your name is written. Someone said that when you do that, your name is written in gold. <laughs> I don't know if there are some written in silver or some other, but your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then you, be, you become fruitful. Amen? Amen? That is one of the surest way of fruitfulness. In fact, it's the beginning and the most profound. So, you must turn away, you must repent from your sins, you must turn away from everything that besets, you must pull yourself away from those. And you know that receiving Christ is by faith. Um, I just want to ask, because I wouldn't want to push this to the end. That if you know that you have not personally confessed Jesus Christ, you have never received him. And you know, receiving Christ is a conscious thing, very conscious. It's not that you follow anybody. you get to a time when you invite Christ into your life. And that was what happened to me. My parents were Christians. I used to follow them. You know, 
well, it, it, it meant nothing to me until that day when a sermon was preached and this passage was read. Romans 10 verses 9 and 10. I stepped forward. I said, I want to I want to confess Jesus Christ. I want to receive him into my life. And it happened. Well, it didn't change me suddenly, but I knew that I had done something that I hadn't done before. I knew that Jesus had come into my life because we were taught to have faith you know, to receive him by faith. And that's what I want us to do. If you want to be fruitful, if you want your life to be fruitful, if you want to be fruitful, I just want to ask, is there anyone that would want to invite Christ into his life? Not just for those, in, those of us in this sanctuary, and those that are watching us on stream, if you have never confess Jesus Christ, you have never invited him into your life, this is the best opportunity to do so because you will, you will be starting on the right ground. You will be planted in, on the right ground in Jesus Christ and you will be fruitful. Now for those who would want to do that, I want to just lead you in a prayer. And um, you can pray this and no doubt or without any doubt, Jesus will come into your life. In Revelations 3.20, the Bible tells us that, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open, open the door, I will come in and eat with you and you with me. Okay? Jesus is standing at the door. He knows you. He knows you as Indi, as an Indi. In fact, he knows you more than you know yourself. So I'd like, if you want to be fruitful, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I come before you today. I'm sorry that I've been running my own life. I have sinned against you. Forgive me my sins. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Take control of my life. Make me a new person. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you are saying that prayer for the first time, know that Jesus has come into your life and he will make you uh, fruitful. We will continue with the other um, keys. Another key of fruitfulness is stay connected to the vine. Stay connected to the vine. Stay connected to the vine. Now, how do I do that? How do I stay connected to the vine? We stay connected. As a Christian, you stay connected to the vine through the world dwelling on the word through prayer through fellowship and through sharing your faith with others so to be truly connected to the vine you must begin to feed on the word I'm talking about the word now you must begin to feed on the word stay connected eat the word eat it now, every farmer knows that um, for his crop to grow, the soil must be fertile. 
You know, the crops need the new trends. And even those that are taking care of livestock, maybe cattle, sheep, they know that for this sheep to be robust, to be strong, big, they have to be fed very well. So as a Christian, for you to grow and to be fruitful, you must feed on the word. And I'll give you one or two passages that encourage us to stay on the word. In Psalm 1, verses 2 to 3, which we read, it talks about delighting, you know, that that righteous man, he, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Okay? So, it's not just to know that, yes, I have a Bible. But take delight in it. Take interest in it. Read it day and night. Because when you do that, a lot of blessings is yours. Um, this is exactly the same word that God told Joshua. Joshua in Joshua 1.8. The Bible says, do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you will be careful to do everything written in it. And the result is, then you will be prosperous and successful. So when you dwell on the world, you will be fruitful. You will be prosperous. A farmer who has a lot of, you know, who is, who is fruitful, is prosperous. So if you want to prosper, dwell on the world. The world is very important. Jesus describes it as the bread of life. That I am the bread of life. You know, Jesus is the world. I am the bread of, the, of life. That anyone who am the bread that comes from heaven, if you eat, if you eat, you have life. So feed on the word. Talking about um, prayer, prayer should be seen as the air that the Christian breathes. If I ask you to hold your breath for the next five minutes, hold your nose, close your mouth, don't even talk, don't, I don't know how many of us will survive it for five minutes, just five minutes. Now, prayer to a Christian should be like the air that we breathe, the oxygen. There should be a, a mobile communication line, a hotline between you and God. In some religions, they are proud that they pray maybe five times a day. Others say, in our religion, we pray six times a day and so on. But for Christians, how many times do we pray? Always, without ceasing. Please get to know that. I mean, if someone is, is being proud that he prays five times in a day, I mean, tell them that my law has taught me to pray all the time, to pray without ceasing, because prayer is the air that I breathe. Prayer is, 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 is the thing that keeps me alive. Without oxygen, I wouldn't be alive. Just take maybe John or Mr. John. Now, Mr. John is a Christian. And um, he wakes up in the morning. He does his quiet time. Kneels down, he prays. He reads the Bible. As he gets up, maybe his phone rings. And, um, you know, a neighbor called to say that, that my wife was very sick over the night. And um, we're just waiting for the ambulance. Now, Mr. John, 
because he's a Christian, he knows that the answer is not only in hospital. He knows that the answer is in God. He kneels down and prays. And then as he gets out, he's trying to drive to his office and suddenly he notices an accident. Some people were in pain. There was a lot, a lot of blood and you know, and Mr. John bows his head and prays for those people. He doesn't know them, but he prays for them. Before, before he gets to the office, you discover that Mr. John has prayed about five, six, seven times. That is only in the morning. Now, as the day progresses, you can imagine that by the time he is closing from the office, we must have prayed more than 20 times. Because we have been called into a relationship of prayer. And you know, Jesus set an example for us for prayer. He set that example. I love that passage that says that Jesus would get up early in the morning and pray. Mark Chapter 1 and verse 35. Mark 1 35. It says, Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and slipped out to a solitary place to pray. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up. He got up. He got up. He didn't. Just say, okay, my bed is still nice. It's, you didn't want to still roll like some of us will do. Um, uh, trying to, you are trying to. You are not even going anywhere. Just to get down on your knees to pray. It is, it is the bed is sweeter at that time, and you roll and roll. No, Jesus left the bed. He left the the comfort of the house. We are not told maybe the the weather outside. But that was nothing to him. He went to a solitary place and prayed. That is an example he has set for us. So are there interruptions and disturbances within your premises? Get out to a solitary prayer, a solitary place. Maybe for us here, a solitary place could be your office. Or it could be, you know, the church. Just run to the church to pray. Maybe a Saturday, and um, you know that, uh, yes, there could be someone to open the church. Just come to the church and pray. So, prayer is very, is key, is fundamental. It's something that if we want to be fruitful, we must pray. There's no option to it. And of course, like I said, it starts with your time, quiet time. Quiet time in the morning, you and God. Earlier on, um, Elder Femi was talking about you having your quiet time, time with God. It's very important. Don't wait until it is uh, prayer time. So, you know, the church is going to meet at 8. That's the only time. You... No, no, no. That's, that shouldn't be. You should even create your own time. To meet with your God. So prayer is very important. Fellowship um, is so, so key. It's a fundamental, one of those things that actually can help us stay connected to the vine. The Bible says, iron sharpened iron. And that. So it is, a man sharpens the countenance of another. You see, when we meet in church like this, someone shares with you something that the Lord has taught you. And you know that you have been going through a similar situation. Now God is using that brother or that sister to encourage you. So fellowship is very, very important. The early apostles in, in Acts chapter 2, particularly 
down to um, you know Acts chapter two, getting right down to um, verse forty-two. It talks about you know the need for the church actually to get together in fellowship. So the Bible says that the disciples devoted themselves to fellowship, to prayer, to doctrine, the word. You know, they devoted themselves to these. So these are like the key fundamentals. These are like the pillars. The pillars that actually hold, hold the church. And then lastly, lastly, um, witnessing, sharing the word with others. So what God has been teaching you, it's not just for you. When we see people standing here preaching, preaching, God has been teaching him so many things. And it is very important that he shares it out, that he reaches out. So many of us have become like Dead Sea. We keep on receiving. We are receiving. We keep on receiving the word. Right from the time we were small in Sunday school, we've been taught. We never let it out to anybody. We didn't tell any of our friends. You know, we keep receiving. But I challenge you today that you should get out to evangelize. So when the church calls for evangelism, please make sure, just make sure you come. Be a part of it. You may not know it all in one day, but most certainly, as you practice, as you reach out, God is there helping you. And when you do these things, there's no way you cannot be fruitful. God will help you to be fruitful. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you so much, O oh God, for the gift of your word. We thank you for the entrance of your word. We believe, O oh God, in heaven that, Lord, you have taught us something and that, Lord God Almighty, you will help us to walk on it. Amen. Lord, we desire to be fruitful and we pray that you help us to, be, to stay connected. Amen. That we will stay connected to you in, in prayer, in fellowship, in the, in the study of the word of God. That Lord will stay connected to the vine. Amen. We bless you, O God. Amen. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise the name of the Lord. Amen.